The fighting. On the fighting line, some back and forth at a few locations, lots of shelling, and very little indeed from the southern sector. At the village Verknakomyansku, Donetsk region, east of Siviersk, Ukrainian armed forces made a limited counterattack and took the village. This secured a reasonably solid line of defense, built on the Kamiansku River, about 3 km south of the Siviersky Donetsk River, which the RF tried very hard to cross in May but got badly cut up. According to the Army General Staff, AGS, the RF tried to storm the Ugolgorsk power station and expand positions near the village Dolomitnoi area with little success. The AGS statement credited 79th Air Assault Brigade with destroying at least five RF tanks in the process. There were others, it's very unlikely to be faked. That's two days in a row the RF has attempted to push onward following the capture of Lysikansk, only to get shot up fairly badly with the loss of tanks and crews that are far from easy to replace. In both cases, we've seen imaged of RF tanks clumped far more closely together than properly deployed tanks units should be. Reportedly there were prisoners, never a good sign, particularly in a tank unit, it means bad morale and failure to support tanks with infantry. This is an indicator of Ukrainian armed forces efforts to force the RF to come a certain direction using minefields and terrain, RF tactical ignorance, or both. But by this point in the way, it isn't an accident, over and over we have seen RF armored columns drive into Ukrainian armed forces ambushes. The really telling thing is, how similar failures like that look in July, as compared to ambushes the Russians hit in March. The RF is capable of learning in some ways, but when it comes to a tank attack, it really looks like they can't. Reach out and touch someone. The Ukrainians have not run out of long-range artillery rockets. On Saturday, in Kherson, RF air defense missiles kicked in, but there nonetheless was an explosion. No clear information as to the weapon used, but in the general opinion of the blogosphere, both sides, an RF ammo dump was hit. Later there were reports that Chernobyvka airfield was hit, again, but it's not clear to me if this was a separate strike or just more precise information about the Kherson strike. In the LPR, town of Imrino, according to an LPR spokesman who was the ambassador to Moscow, a Himars rocket fired from around Bakhmut struck at 5.30 a.m. smoke and fire followed but no info on what was hit. In the Donetsk region town Kartsysk, which was hit yesterday during the night by Ukrainian armed forces long-range rocket artillery, pop and fireworks were reported in the vicinity of an ammo depot. In the Luhansk region town Kadyivka, also during the night, something blew up near the town ammo depot, followed by secondary explosions and a big fire. It is worth noting this wave of strikes was preceded on Friday by the following long-range attacks, Shakhtarsk, Donetsk, ammo dump, Nova Kakavka, Kherson region, Ammo Dump, Snizny, Donetsk region. Ammo Dump, Debaltsev, Donetsk region, Ammo Dump, Donetsk, Proltarsky district, Ammo Dump. In the Kherson sector, same day, yesterday Ukrainian armed forces rocket and artillery units destroyed two command posts of the enemy army, this according to the press center spokeswoman of Joint Command South Natalia Gumenyuk. It will be interesting to see what the Ukrainian armed forces runs out of first, rocket packages for the Hamars, or targets for the Hamars to shoot at. It is worth noting that the Ukrainian armed forces is already calculating what might be attackable if the next tranche of American weapons includes Hamars rockets capable of 300 to 350 kilometers range, which is standard issue in the US Army, but not yet in the hands of the Ukrainians. It's a pretty big strike envelope, and the key thing to note is that if Kiev gets rockets of that range, most of the RF Army's major military infrastructure, air bases, command headquarters, fuel storage sites, strategic air defense radars, would theoretically become untenable. The RF has made giant investments in Crimean military infrastructure, and it was all built with the assumption it would be impervious not just to Ukrainian, but NATO attack. The same air RF defenses that defend Crimea supposedly should have intercepted today's strikes at Kherson slash Chernobyvka. Clearly, the weapons got through. Video of that. The record needs to reflect the RF hasn't stopped shooting. This morning, according to Vitaly Kim, Mikolaev got hit B-6S-300 missiles. 
This is very weird because S-300 is an expensive anti-aircraft missile not normally used for bombarding anything. So either Kim has something wrong, or the RF is so intent on blasting ground targets, it's using very hard to replace anti-aircraft missiles to do it. Stuff for Ukraine And the next batch of weapons from the US, according to the Pentagon, will be four more HIMARS plus ammunition, which is the Pentagon being coy because the real effectiveness of this weapons really depends on how often you can reload it. However, the rockets will be precision GPS guided rockets, meaning that if slash until the RF manages to figure out a way to take out the HIMARS or its rockets, the Ukrainian armed forces will have 12 systems able to destroy pretty much anything the RF has in the field, within probably 150 kilometers of the front with impunity. This would not be very different from having two to four attack jet squadrons on your side, with absolute air superiority. The other bad news is that the Americans have decided the Ukrainians can be trusted with Excalibur 155mm artillery shells, which are laser guided. This means any Ukrainian armed forces infantryman with a special laser pointer, or indeed drone or helicopter, can fly one of these munitions in with an accuracy of up to 2 meters. Skilled operators supposedly can drop the thing into a barrel. Aside from the very great danger a weapon like this poses to literally all RF vehicles as the 155mm will pretty much destroy anything it hits, this shell would be devastating for RF defensive positions because, and I am not exaggerating, the Ukrainian armed forces would literally be able to pick out individual foxholes and even soldiers before attacking. The main weakness to Excalibur is a moving target, it can hit them but that's harder. Trenches and bunkers don't move. In Russia, Governor of the Bryansk region Alexander Bogomaz reported that an explosive device went off at a railway station on railway tracks in Bryansk. There were no casualties, he said. News reports point out the RF moves a lot of military equipment through Bryansk switching stations. Under occupation, According to the UA-associated news platform KRYM Realii, for some reason today all of the Crimean capital Simferopol was blacked out, no light in shopping centers and cafes, trolleybuses froze in their tracks, the Russian mobile phone network MTS shut down completely, and the mobile operator when mobile network was working intermittently. Residents of the annexed Crimea report blackouts in social networks. It may not have been the war, the RF has struggled to deliver enough power to Crimea, and most of the electricity comes through a cable crossing the Kerch Strait. Blackouts happen in Crimea regularly. But of course, now maybe it was the Ukrainian armed forces. At sea. The Ukrainian news sources operating in Sevastopol are still dutifully recording the comings and goings of ships in the Black Sea Fleet. For reasons best known to the Russians, four of the fleet's torrential guided missile corvettes are tied up at the military wharf and, therefore, not contributing to RF maritime control of the Black Sea. Speculation is that the Russians have decided that the Tarantals, which carry only anti-ship missiles, don't have much to do sailing around in the Black Sea, what with Ukraine not having a navy at all, except be targets. Ukraine has its own anti-ship missiles and now harpoon missiles, both are designed to take out big warships, so either, if it hit a little tarantal, would leave not much but scrap. Look to see warship ships like that clear out of Sevastopol completely the moment the long-range Mars rockets get into the Ukrainians' hands. The future according to Defense Ministry Olesky Reznikov. In an interview Reznikov said, the Ukrainian Armed Forces is preparing for the liberation of Kherson and Zaporizhzhia regions. This will take place maybe not in July, but in August or September. But it will definitely take place. Kiev sees three possible ways the war might end. The Ukrainian Armed Forces pushes the RF Army back to February 23rd lines and then negotiations start. The RF Army fails to handle long-term attrition and becomes combat incapable. This is unlikely before the end of 2022. Internal pressures inside Russia force Russian retreat from Ukraine and possibly Russian regime change. This will certainly happen in our lifetimes, but not necessarily before the war ends. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video. You can also watch other videos offered on my channel.